Amen. Let's start with Psalm 107. Praise the Lord. This is a. Does everybody got a book? Is there books out there? You're gonna need it. All right. Okay. This is a tough song to start on. So. Not okay. See if you're awake. Praise the Lord, ye heavens of glory. Praise Him. Despite your loss of an hour of sleep, you know, we knew it was coming. It turned out pretty good. <laughs> Amen. Yes. 
set us free. Good morning. 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 <laughs> welcome, welcome everyone to our church service this morning. If you could, you can turn over to Matthew chapter 7. As you know, we've been going through teaching about kingdom culture. That's right. And we've been reading through the Beatitudes. And it has been wonderful and great. If you didn't know, um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was the first word spoken by a prophet in about four, five, six hundred years. And as you know, reading through the Beatitude, he talked about how you have been blessed. You know, you're blessed if you're poor in spirit and heart, you're blessed if you've been meek. But prior to that, the prophets have been coming down and saying that, yeah, Y'all need to repent. Uh, they said y'all. Yeah, they just say y'all. <laughs> y'all. That uh, things need to change. And things need to be different. But Jesus was different. He took his first sermon is about how God has been blessing you by your righteousness. And that was kind of amazing because they're, they're expecting another prophet to come down. They're expecting, you know, another sermon about changing and repenting. And here it is. Jesus come down with a sermon on encouragement and, and, and things like that. And they were amazed. In fact, it's believed that this is Jesus' first sermon. And if you look at Matthew 7 and verse 28, the Bible reads, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd was amazed, were amazed at his teaching. That even after Jesus' first sermon, those who were there were amazed at what he, he taught. And so today, we come together in service to actually hear Jesus' words. And just like his first sermon, we can also be amazed at what Jesus taught and what Jesus has done. And um, what Jesus, uh, what God has sent him uh, to do. And to help us out in being uh, led in Jesus' words, we have Henry Lana Kramer delivering us the communion and Jameson uh, preaching the word to us. So, again, welcome to the service and an opportunity for us to gather as he did at Jesus' first sermon to be amazed at what he had done and what God had done. So, let us pray for our sermon. Our service. Uh, God, Father in heaven, uh, we're grateful, God, that you uh, brought us here today. Father, there's another opportunity, Father, to gather as like the first crowd did to hear Jesus' words and be amazed that, God, you still are delivering uh, that amazement to us by having us gather here today, Father, in worship and service to you. Pray you be with the Kramers as you deliver communion and pray you be with Jameson as he delivers uh, the word. Again, we're grateful and thankful in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing song 404, Nearer, Still Nearer. So 
appreciate Frank reminding us about the centrality of Jesus and his life, that beautiful song about near and near. And now we're coming to the part of the worship service where we focus exclusively on Jesus, his life, and his death and his resurrection. And, you know, five weeks from now, we're going to celebrate Easter, yeah. which is a real incredible day in our calendar and a great time. And something I like to do is to make sure in the lead up to it that my studies are uh, in line with Jesus and learning more about him and drawing closer to him because he has set up what we're about to do. He did it for us and he paid a high price so that we can remember him. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew 16. But it's very hard to remember somebody if you really don't know who they are. And you really haven't held on to those characteristics that are lasting memories. I mean, we all have lasting memories of many things. We can have lasting memories of smells. <laughs> we can have lasting memories uh, of different life events, positive and negative, but people, there's usually special things about them. Their smile, their glint in their eye, the way they made you feel is how you remember them. Yep. And so here we have this whole chapter, and it's an amazing chapter to read its entirety, which we're not going to do. James will priest for us. We're just focused on communion here. Um, but starting in verse 13 of Matthew 16. He's already had this period where he's dealt with some religious people called the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he's finally got his group back together. And they've been intermixing with the crowds for a couple of years now. And they came to this area called Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist. You know, others, uh, it's Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And have you really thought about those answers and what they really mean? I, I did it really until I studied it out, you know, in the, uh, today, uh, <laughs> this morning, <laughs> right before church. No, it's a little bit before that. But <laughs> this morning, as I was reading some text on it, and it's really interesting because you think, okay, John the Baptist. Well, they were about the same age and they both had uh, you know, followings and they both had ministries, okay? And so if you weren't really particularly interested, you'd say, well, it's, maybe it's that dude. I'm not really sure. I'm not going to spend time to figure it out. I just know they're about the same time and they're out doing something, trying to draw people to God. Great. Then the other one says, no, maybe Elijah. Well, they're maybe a little bit more enlightened. They've been waiting 400 years. They're looking for something. Maybe this is it. You know, maybe this ministering, you know, to the to the infirmed and the oppressed and liberation. Maybe maybe it's Elijah. You know, they're a little bit more looking forward to drawing near. And then you got the Jeremiah group, the weeping prophet. They're saying, yeah, he's just one of the, you know, he's just one of the prophets, probably, you know, just kind of going along with, you know, whatever. And Jesus listens to this because his guys, they're not isolated. They're not monks. They're not in a cloistered environment. They're out mixing it up with people. And he just kind of wants to know how they're being impacted by what people are saying about him. And whether or not anyone's getting the message straight. And so he goes, okay, all right, fine. But what about you? <laughs> Who do you say I am? And Peter says... You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. At this point, Lana is going to share who Jesus is to her and how it's been revealed by her father in heaven. Lana. Well, most recently, hello everybody, um, it's great to be together. Uh, I think most recently, um, and, and I'm so grateful we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' first sermon, this really um, reacquainted me um, as not a, f a, f a follower for sure, but with Jesus as my friend and my guide and my comfort. Uh, because I, um, 
I, I struggle with guilt a lot. And um, you get old enough, too, and you know that you've made some mistakes, you know. I mean, I was young, and I first became a Christian. It was so obvious, like, oh my gosh, forgiveness. I'm getting forgiven for all this. Wow. Um, <clears throat> but as kind of, I didn't forget about it, but I became sort of numb to that reality. Um, and ever since I've been here, really the last three and a half years, I've, I've, I've been more aware of that. And I think as I've had to be kind of whittled down, you know, I haven't had all the distractions of my life in Los Angeles and loads of people around me all the time and loads of fun and uh, it's been great, but it hasn't been like that. And, um, and so I'm very grateful for Jesus because he, he, he says, come, you know, come to me, all you who are weary and, and burdened, and take my yoke. And the yoke is sometimes even the burden of following a little more closely, being more humble, being more willing to do the hard things. But just most recently, I was listening to a sermon, uh, or an exhortation, I guess, and it was so interesting because I heard this passage, you know, um, I believe it's Revelation 3.20, but it talks about come to me, all you, I mean, not come to, excuse me, knock, um, I come to, uh, and those who want to come to me is knock on the door, and I, you know, uh, and, um, I will come in, and we will commune together. I'm not doing a very good job of that. Probably should read it. But, but you know, this whole knocking on the door, and that was kind of used in another context, but I realized, no, it was for the Christians. So just having that, you know, I'm here, Jesus, help, uh, as a friend, as you would do that with a friend. You would knock on their door and you'd talk to them about your worries and your guilt and your, um, your fears. And I have really found the Holy Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, just really come in and, uh, and minister to me that way. And uh, so that's, that's what it's been, and, and uh, it's been, I just thank Him for that. Amen. Let's go to our Father in prayer, and then we'll uh, take the elements. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you knew that at least every week we needed to come together. It's probably a lot more common, more frequently in the past. But anyway, at least once we could come together and to break bread and to, uh, to take the fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' blood and to really remember just how unique Jesus is and remember who he is for us as individuals and a collective. Father, I think it's important for me to remember my life before I really embraced Jesus as Lord. I knew who he was before that. I think most people do in our culture, but to really understand that he was my only hope. He was my only redeemer. He was the only one who died for me so I could have in a relationship with you. And I, Father, I, I know that as I remember that more and more, I do see him as uh, just an incredible, incredible uh, leader in my life. But also, as Lana said, just a dear friend, someone I can talk to and relate to and that he walks with me and that he paid a huge price so the counselor would guide me. And God, I pray that as every man and woman in this group remembers Jesus today, that they will feel a special connection and an appreciation that he was mm -hmm. sinless, mm -hmm. that he put up with a lot of baloney. Mm -hmm. And that Father, through it all, he remained humble and he followed your way, Father, and he did it in a fashion that honored you. God, thank you for his life. Please bless this time together. So Jesus, we pray. Amen. Part of our community meditation, we'll be singing 456. My soul.
and stand up. We're going to sing In Christ Alone. because we can do that when we have a bit of a smaller crowd. Welcome to spring break, everybody. Uh, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. As Frank mentioned, we are going to continue our series, uh, The Counterculture Kingdom. And uh, we're going to focus on the Sermon on the Mount, in particular, verses 13 through 16. But to do that, I want to remind us a bit of where we've come so far. Because context is important. So in Matthew chapter 4, let's look at what it says there in verse 25. So Jesus has begun his ministry. He's drawing large crowds. 
And in verse 25, it says, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, and Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So there's large and very diverse crowds. There's people from Jerusalem and Judea. There's also people from the Decapolis, which is uh, another word for the 10 cities, and Galilee and the surrounding areas. And so actually this is not a homogenous crowd where everybody is from the same place and thinks the same thing. This is a very diverse crowd with a very diverse group of thoughts and paradigms about themselves, about God, their upbringings, and where they stand in the world. And all of those diverse group of people are following Jesus. And he takes that opportunity in chapter 5, verse 1. To preach his kickoff sermon. Now, this is chapter 5 1. When he saw those crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Who was he teaching? His disciples. Now, the crowds were there, the crowds were following him. They were probably even within earshot, so for sure they heard this too. However, when he goes up on the mountainside, he sees the crowds, he goes up on the mountainside and calls his disciples. And he began to teach his disciples. And so while he does that, he says, the, the, the Beatitudes which we are very familiar with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can imagine him sitting there with his 12, saying, uh, we don't have his body language or his inflection, so we have to sort of infer it, right? So, but I imagine him, kind of his guys huddled around him, and he says, blessed are the, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And as he says theirs, I picture him kind of pointing to the crowds, the diverse crowds that are following him, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, and I, I picture him continuing to motion towards the crowds. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But here there's a switch. There's a very, a very definite shift in what he says. He was saying those and they and theirs. And then he says, blessed are you, talking to his disciples. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you get the picture. Jesus is talking about the crowds coming to him and he's telling his disciples, these people are going to be blessed because they're poor in spirit, and because they're meek, and because they hunger and thirst for righteousness. And sometimes it seems like maybe that's an aspirational thing. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I think that's true, but it also implies a lack of something. If you're hungering and thirsting, like a lack of righteousness, right? And so the idea is that, man, these crowds, they don't have these things, but they are coming to me and therefore they're going to be blessed. And then he switches it up on them and says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of lies and false things about you not just for gossip's sake, but because of me, because of Jesus. So in a sense, what he's saying is these people are coming to be citizens of the kingdom and they're going to be blessed in that. They're going to, they're going to get that and they're going to reap, reap all the rewards and the benefits. And blessed, it's not just like, you know, God giving you a high five or, you know, giving you a bunch of money or something. It's like God's favor lies with these people. Or when you are in this group, you receive God's favor. But then to his disciples, it's almost kind of a warning. Blessed are you when people persecute you. As if saying, if you want to build the kingdom, if you want to lean into this call of discipleship, you're going to be persecuted. If you want to get involved in this mess that you see around you, you're going to face insults. And you're going to be blessed because of it. So he talks about the crowd, but then he teaches specifically his disciples. And then again, to his disciples, he starts in verse 13. And this is the text that we're going to spend most of the time in for the rest of today. Verse 13, to his disciples, he says, you 
are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus talks about salt and light, and that's what we're going to talk about today, but it's in a context that we're not very familiar with. Uh, because we use salt as flavor and seasoning. We sprinkle a little salt on something. We had the college students over Friday night, and uh, I cooked up some brisket and some wings, and whoo, it was good. Wasn't it good? Uh, so much so that for a, a lot of the students actually are, for Lent or for health reasons or whatever else, uh, vegan and vegetarian, for at least temporarily. But they decided when they saw the meat that it was cheat day. <laughs> and I gotta say, I was kind of proud of that, even though they were going back on the commitment or whatever. And uh, Yushima in particular, cut, I cut off a little bit of brisket, smoked brisket, and I had seasoned it pretty simply just with salt and pepper and lots and lots of smoke and thyme. That's, <laughs> and then. And she tasted it, and as soon as she tasted it, she goes, oh. Oh, was that like chills or something? Because it had been so long since she had meat, and it was good. So when we think of salt, that's kind of what we think of. But in the ancient world, that's not necessarily what would come to mind with salt. Salt, for sure, was used for flavor, but was a preservative, and it preserved things. It was also uh, a thing of value. It was a commodity, so much so that the word that we use, salary, comes from, originates from the word salt. It was a thing of value, and Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Today, if we call somebody the salt of the earth kind of person, it's like a blue collar, just a good guy, and a good girl, he just work hard, and stuff like that. And, that's great, that's not necessarily what Jesus means by that. He's calling his disciples preservers of the world. Something of so much value that in fact, not only are you salt, you're a city up on a hill. And again, in ancient times you could imagine, I'd like to challenge you to sort of put yourself in the shoes of, let's say a traveler going from one place to another, or you're a little village and you've got some commodities to sell and you're looking for the town and it's night and uh, there's bandits on the road or whatever and you got your little donkey there and finally you see the city up on a hill and all the lights and the walls surrounding it and that city represents not just a place where there's a bunch of people, it, it represents safety and resources and light and, and everything that you would need. And that's what Jesus calls his disciples, the salt of the earth, to preserve the earth, but also a city on a hill, the light of the world, a place where there's safety, where there's resources, a place you want to be. And I read this, and I, I got to be honest, I feel challenged by that. I feel challenged by both of those things because I don't always feel like the salt of the earth. I don't always feel like my life is a light to the world around me. But that's who Jesus says we are. Whether we feel like it or not, whether in the moment we're doing a great job of following him or not, our identity is still salt and light. That's who we are in Jesus. Jesus has always, always intended to have partners in changing the world, right? He was only one person but he had a collective of disciples around him. And he told those guys, okay, you now go make more disciples. Here's how you do it. Uh, teach them everything I've commanded you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and continue walking with them. And those he considered his partners in changing the world, in being the salt of the earth and being a city up on a hill. And he considers us his partners as well in changing the world around us. We are Jesus's partners in changing the world. Because we have our identity in him. But here's the challenge. If we're supposed to be so different, or if we're supposed to be a community here locally that is counterculture to the folks all around us, not because we're any better or anything else, but because we have a different hope, right? That must mean we should respond to difficulties in a different way, right? We should respond to all of the things that the world is freaking out about with faith rather than fear. I don't know if I always do a great job of that. 
Uh, what I want to do, because I said we have a bit of a smaller crowd, we can actually have a discussion. I'd like us to try and analyze. Not necessarily how are you doing this personally, but more aspirationally, how can we be a city on a hill in this community here and now with all the craziness going on in the world? Let's talk, for instance, about oh, coronavirus. Let's talk about that. Why not? Because everybody else is talking about it and everybody in the world is freaking out about it. And I'm not here to minimize any of that because I'm not a medical professional. We have one in the house and uh, I noticed he wasn't giving as much hugs or high fives, uh, maybe doing like a fist bump or an or a elbow bump or something like that. By the way, Mike Pence, who is the vice president and in charge of messaging around the coronavirus is also doing the, the elbow bump. So maybe there's something to that. I don't know. I'm not talking about uh, whether it's something to be fearful of or not. What I am talking about is how we respond to a crisis. Okay, so the world around us is freaking out about the coronavirus and everybody's being quarantined and uh, there's just a lot of fear and sensationalism, I would say, about that. Again, don't take my advice on anything medical. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual. How can we as disciples respond differently in a health crisis? Let's talk about that. That's not a rhetorical question. I'd like for us to, to think about how in this community can we be a light, a city on a hill, when everybody around us is kind of freaking out about a medical crisis, a public health crisis. How, how can we do that? Because that's very real. I don't want to die, but if I'm going to die, I believe this stuff. I get to go be with God in heaven. I mean, Amen. okay. Amen. You know? And uh, I was sort of taken aback by that. Like, wow, okay. I mean, it's not sadistic. He, he really does want to be here, but also he's not afraid of the same things that everybody else is afraid of because his hope is in God. Yeah. What else? How can we be a city on a hill? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Jesus was a master empathizer. It, just take a minute to think about all the different type of people we had meaningful conversations with who felt like they could express themselves to him. He wasn't intimidating, except to people he needed to be intimidating with, usually the religious leaders. Uh, he welcomed everybody, and even the crowd there is indicative of the fact that people felt like they could, people from diverse backgrounds and diverse places felt like they could come to Jesus, probably because he had the ability to empathize and, yeah, also to listen. What a, wash your hands. Please do that anyway. Wash your hands anyway. I have, a, I have a real issue with touching anything in the bathroom because I know so many people don't wash their hands. I don't touch anything in the bathroom. I'm just saying. It's, it's gross. Paper towels all the time. Or like open the door with my jacket or something. How about my gloves? <laughs> okay. Uh, what about something else that we are all currently experiencing that's in the news all the time just as much as the coronavirus? Our current political situation, the current polarized political situation. This is a campaign year and you cannot, even if you wanted to, you can't get away from all the news and the latest tweets and all of the debates and everything else. How can we as disciples, by the way, with diverse political backgrounds and beliefs and philosophies, how can we be a city on a hill? Yeah, absolutely. If our hope is in politics and politicians, we will be let down. We get to put our hope in Jesus and the biggest impact we can have in the world. I'm not saying don't vote. Go vote. That's fine. Even if you want to protest or whatever, you can do, you got freedom to do that. But if that's where your hope lies and your hope in changing the world and changing your situation, you wow. will be let down. Oh boy. Next time. Big time. Yeah, a lot. And again, we're not saying you have to be removed from our community or you can't be politically active, but are you playing the same game that everybody else is? And like whatever side of the aisle you happen to be on, those other people are so stupid. Can you believe how foolish they are? They vote against their own interests and they have no idea and they're just ridiculous. Are we play we as disciples shouldn't be playing that game. Whether it's in person or on social media. Don't touch that. It's true. If we're called to be citizens of the kingdom of God, that takes priority over our citizenship as Americans. And that can be controversial or whatever, but I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God first. Right. I love living here. There's a, there's a lot of benefits from being an American citizen. I'm not going to say that. And, you know, <coughs> welcome everybody who wants to be an American citizen. That's awesome. However, 
My real citizenship is in the eternal kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe a great way to think about it would be like, if Jesus were here, what, what would be his politics? What party would he support? If, if Jesus made any political statements in the New Testament, it's rebuking people in power, period. <laughs> because they were taking advantage of the poor and the needy. So I don't know what his political stance would be. But usually, Jesus blesses the poor and the meek and rebukes those in power who tend to take advantage of their power. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, forcing Christianity through laws is how you get stuff like the Crusades. I mean, you, you could justify almost anything if, if you're trying to go that route. But Jesus and, and his disciples, the apostles, spoke to people's hearts and they, they changed people's hearts. They didn't enforce it. If anybody could have been an enforcer, it was Jesus. And he goes, I, I didn't call 10,000 angels. Don't you think I could have? But I didn't. Yeah, and again, this is something that we can't avoid. Yeah. But what we can do is be different than the culture around us. That's right. We can be a city on a hill. Mm -hmm. Finally, back to the text, what can we do when people persecute us? Falsely say all kinds of things about us, insult us because of our belief in Jesus. What can we do? Do we sue? Do we argue? Do we debate? How can we respond when that happens? Not if, but when that happens. Yeah, if Jesus is our model, I mean, people insulted him all the time. And what was his reaction? Yeah. You know? Oh, man. Hey, Aaron wants a kid. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go about doing what I got to do. Today, oh, you... tomorrow, the day after. Yeah. Yes. It was just kind of, nah. You couldn't incite a reaction out of Jesus that he wasn't ready and intentional yeah. Yeah. to give. And I think, you know, Jesus is not calling us to be doormats, because he wasn't a doormat. But he did choose to submit himself at times when it was his choice. He, in fact, he says, I lay my life down. Right? It was his choice to lay his life down. Uh, and I think bitterness can come in when we feel like our uh, power or choice is, is taken away. And it's done to us rather than we, we choose to submit. Yeah. I think these are all great points, um, and I appreciate the discussion that we have, because uh, preaching doesn't always have to come through one source, you know what I mean? We can, we can speak the truth to one another, and uh, that's, I think, what we did a little bit of today, but I do want to remind us that Jesus says our identity is salt, and our identity is light. When we're following Jesus, we're like him, that's who we are, okay? No matter what degree you happen to be, you know, following him in a given moment, your identity is in him as salt. And light. I have a challenge for us this week as we go into this week. It's to be intentional about your impact. If you're a city on a hill, if you're the light of the world, you need to be intentional about the impact that you have on the world around you. Think about how you're reacting to everybody else's fears. Think about how you're reacting to everybody else's personalities. Think about how you're reacting in any given situation. Be intentional about your impact. And also be the light because you've been enlightened. The reason we are the light is not because we're the source of the light, but because we have Jesus in us if we're disciples and because we have his words right here. Let us be enlightened by his words so that we can reflect the light around us, so that we can be the light of the world. So be intentional about your impact and be the light because you have been enlightened. Let's pray. God, thank you for all of the voices that we've heard today, in particular for Jesus' voice. And I pray that we can allow Jesus' voice to shape who we are, uh, to change us from the inside out, uh, that we can be a part of his counterculture kingdom based on our identity in him. God, help us to be salty. Help us to be the light to people around us. And I pray that this church, the Nittany Church, can be a city on a hill. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello, um, we're going to take contribution um, right now, and so it's just a time for us to give back to the church, uh, for members of the church, and then I have some announcements while we do that. Um, the financial workshop is this Wednesday at 6.30 like normal, um, and then 
It's also National Women's Day uh, today, and so in light of that, it's like Women's Month. So we're going to have a women's brunch event on March 21st at 9.30 a.m. here at the building. And there's a flyer that was posted on Facebook, and I think Lauren invited um, everyone to it um, and also it was sent in an email so you can invite people with the event um, flyer and then you can also invite them through the Facebook posts and we're also on Friday gonna have a day of fasting and prayer for the women's brunch so um, just for women across the world to know God and to um, experience his love and also for people to show up to the event and for it to be effective and then uh, there's gonna be a family group leaders meeting after service for like five minutes and that's it. We're going to have one last song. Amen. Let's stand and sing one last song. Song 463. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame.